We want to welcome you tonight to our Wednesday night Bible study. Tonight we're going to be looking at it takes transforming power of God, the Holy Spirit, to know Jesus. What we're going to do is continue in our study of Acts. We were going through Acts when we're doing, going through our 21 days of preparation as we're getting ready for Easter. But Acts has been such a, a good book to study that I thought that we would continue on in that because of just the situations what we're living in today and that we begin to understand the empowerment of God in our lives and the empower of the Holy Spirit that is in us. One of the devotional thoughts, and we'll be looking at some of them as well, was talking about in day six, was dealing with Acts chapter six and seven, but it talked about that as the church grew, there was great need among those that had been added to the body of believers, particularly the widows who could not provide for themselves. The apostles knew that they were called to pray and to minister the word. However, a certain um, truth came to them uh, that was concerning the gospel that they must live out the caring of those that are among them. See, it's not enough to do the work. It's about what God has called us to do in him. And so it's always by the leading of the Holy Spirit that we begin to operate and we begin to move. And that's what it was talking about, that they knew that they were there to preach and, and to pray and to minister the word of God to the body of believers, but also the ministry of the people is what it's about. When we were studying in James, James told me that if we had faith, we would see the face by what our works. And that's what we're seeing being operated and, and put it into practice there in, uh, in the book of Acts. And so there it talked about there was a need among them. And it says, and in an effort to ensure that both that these tasks were laid, that they would, that they would do this, that we pick out seven people that were among them, that were dedicated men, to oversee the administration of the physical needs of the body of Christ. There was a deep a, a, um, abiding connection between the power of the gospel of, to transform and the transformation of being expressed in the goodwill and the generosity of believers. So again, it's about what faith into action. And so we're going to be looking at that as we look at the book of Acts. We're going to be looking at how that it, it talks about the work of Peter and how he's using uh, the, the church there in Jerusalem. And then it's going to talk about how God then transfers and brings one to life when we talk about Saul and the transformation of his life in Christ Jesus. So as we begin tonight, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we just come before you tonight, Lord, and we thank you for this day that you made. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you are alive, Lord, and, and you're living in us. We pray tonight, Lord, that as we as believers in Christ, Lord, would be, be strong in you. That we would operate, Lord, not just in the matter of faith, but we would put our faith into action. In this time, Lord, there's a great opportunity to witness, to share the hope that is in us, to encourage others that may not know about this truth, to tell them about God's love and his, how it extends beyond just going to church. It extends about coming into life with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and King. And so, Lord, as we look at the word tonight, we ask that you would help us and, and guide us and, and speak to our hearts, Lord, as we look at your word about the transforming power of God, the Holy Spirit, that it takes that to know Jesus. We ask for your guidance. And so I ask, Lord, that you would give us what ears to hear and a heart to receive, and then a bold courage, Lord, to walk out your word in Jesus' name. Amen. In Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20, it's Paul Peter's confession to Jesus, Jesus as the Christ. And we know that scripture, but I'm going to start out with that tonight to just get us back in line where we're going with the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, because that's what Acts began with. It began about God's promise of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit coming upon the church. And when we read where how that what that it went from that of 120 to 3,000 were added to the church. And so what we find is that, that hundreds of people coming to know Christ, that it, it, 300, I said 3,000, didn't I? Um, 300, that goes on with Gretchen, so we can put that in the, with the bloopers. But what we want to talk about is that 300 were added to it. So it went from a church of, of that of what? Oh, help me. 120. 3,000. God's good and his mercy. 
Sometimes I get to thinking that God loves us so much that we forget about just how much he loves us and how empowered, empowered we are to know him as the Lord and Savior that comes into our life. That 300 were added and, and that God loves us without what? No end. And so in Matthew 16, it just reads this way. Now, when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, and others say Elisha, and others Jeremiah, and one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Well, something about Jesus is one thing to say about that you think you know. Then he's talking to them who should know. And so he was saying to them, there's other people that may think I'm something, but what, who do you believe that I am for you in your life? And Simon Peter boldly spoke, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. When we read that scripture and we hear it so many times, it talks about an empowerment, a place of coming to a, a, of understanding who God is in our life. And then when Jesus says, who I am I? And the Spirit of God revealed it to Peter that he is what? Truly the Son of God. You are the Christ. You are the one that we have been hoping for. You are the Messiah. You are the anointed one of God. You're the son of the living God. And he says to him, and at that time that he called him first, we talked about Simon Barjona, that he gave his name out, Simon Peter. He talked to him. And now he says to him, Peter, you are Peter. What he was saying to him, you are a little pebble. You're, you're a small rock. He said, you're not that that people can build their life upon, but you're going to be used. You're going to be empowered. And he goes on to say this to him. He says, what? He says, I am on, on that truth that you have given, this rock I will build my church. He said, because I am the Christ, people will come to know my love of God and the love of God that comes and the salvation that will be given to men because of what I will do. As we've just finished uh, going through Easter and going through those times in, in the study that it talked about the reason why Jesus came and that why he is alive today because he rose from the grave with that empowerment. And he says, and because of that, his church will grow. His church will grow and impact upon the lives of, of, of many because of who he is. And he says, and then what? The gates of hell. Now he's talking about that uh, Demonic is talking about the sinfulness of man, is talking about the sinfulness of the world, and all of the things that may come at trying to destroy Jesus Christ, trying to destroy the people of God. It's not talking about the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. It talks about that some of us will mess up, some of us will drop the ball, some churches will start, and some churches will cl close. But he says, But who I am, and when I give eternal life to you, nothing will ever change that. The gates of hell will try to chip away at it, but you will stand because why? I'm the rock in which you are built on. Faith in me. And that's what he's getting across to us. He's getting across to us tonight that our faith in him is enough to allow us to have life in him eternal, that the gates of hell cannot prevent us from being who God has called us to be by faith in Jesus Christ. And so he goes, the scriptures go on to say, and then I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. What he's saying was that I have authority and I have power in you now that you can move in the things that I have called you to and that you have the power and authority of God to bind and to loose. What it means is that we can stand on this, the things of the Lord and the things that we speak out they will begin to become true and alive because of you will have the authority and power what to judge, to correct, 
to build up the body of Christ, to impart to them the empowerment of the Holy Spirit and, and to encourage them to build that life and tell them that they can do this in Christ. For greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You have power to set the, the captives free and that all men and women can grow in the and the understanding of the love of God that he has through the word of God. But it also says that it's also for correction, that he said that the binds and that, that it tells us that they can be able to demonstrate in, in the power of God when things are out of order, how to bring it back in. And so when we look at the scriptures, he was saying this to them, that you have power to bind on earth and you shall bind and power to bind in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth, you will loose in heaven. And he says, and then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he is the Christ. Now we talked about that as we were going through Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Resurrection Sunday. What we talked about was that, that it was a time that came where Jesus let everyone know when he entered into the city that he was the anointed one, he was the Messiah, he was the promise of what scripture had spoke about. And in doing so, he, he was ready to what? Go to Calvary, ready to lay his life down to do that, that he had come to do when he was born of a virgin. When he walked this earth 33 years, he said for this reason that he had come. He understood his purpose was that man who was lost could now come back into a right relationship because he would truly is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so what we have in this scripture is letting us know that in God that we can have an empowerment to, to walk with him and to have a relationship with him. And at this time, he said, that don't tell anyone because why? God had a time schedule, a plan. And when all of this was coming out, and then we saw that as Jesus entered in, all of it was building up to that time through his healing and through the empowerment of the word, the teaching of the word, the living it out and seeing the glory of God upon him and in him. And so he said, don't tell. But today, it tells us, go tell it up on the mountain what that Jesus Christ is king. And that's what we're called to do. In Acts, 20, in Acts 2, verses 32 and 33, we're talking about that this Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witness. And here it was there, Peter was preaching. And what he was saying was, what, therefore, being exalted in the, to the right hand of God and having received... From the Father, the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. Jesus had told them that he was going, but he would send the comforter. And what we saw in Acts 2, the empowerment and the promise of God coming alive because the Holy Spirit came upon them and said with fire, and they began to speak in another language, and people began to hear the Galileans begin to speak with the anointing of the power of God, and they were hearing the word of God that spoke to their hearts. So the promise of God was in full effect when we look at the beginning of Acts. And, and that's what we're talking about, the empowerment of the church, how God began to move to equip his church, empower his church to be able to stand in this day and be faithful to him. Faithful in this sense is that we understand that God is greater than our circumstances and situations that come into our lives that we find ourselves facing. I sometimes say the question, the, the statement, as long as I have Jesus, I have all that I need. And sometimes it sounds like it is a, it's just a nice thing to say, but the reality of it is, is that you may not have anything. Your body may be rattled down in, in pain. You may feel yourself with life coming out of you. You may see yourself have completed the race and that it's all over. And you're coming to that end, across that line. And yet in the midst of it, you're able to rejoice because why? You have Jesus Christ. And as long as I have Jesus, I have everything I need. But not only that, but you have life in him. For that is his promise that where he was going, we would also go also. We would also be there with him. That we should be where he is at. We have this hope, and that's what the Holy Spirit gives to each and every one of us, an eternal hope that we can walk in the things of the Lord. In John chapter 7, in verse 37, it says this, On the last day of the feast, a great day, 
Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And now this is said about the Spirit, whom those who believe in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus had not yet been glorified. But Sunday we said he had been glorified. He raised from the dead. Forty days later, he ascended into heaven. He sits at the right hand of the Father, and He, the Spirit of God is in us. Jesus is in us. For the Holy Spirit is what? Revealing those things to us, telling us those things, encouraging those things concerning Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of our life, that he is the, the mighty God as well as one day he will be that one who will come and, and, tr and transform lives forever. So it talks about that, the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit is, is in us and, and that God has given him us to live and have life in us. So the Holy Spirit is, is alive. The Holy Spirit is, is God in us. And then in John 16, Verse 1, it says, I have said all these things, Jesus is speaking, to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. And if I don't go away, the helper, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they did not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. What it's talking about is that sin no longer can have a hold on us because of the finished work of Jesus. And when we put our trust in him, we will have rivers of living water flowing through us. When I thought about the living water, I thought about the woman at the well. When Jesus said, if you drink of me, you will never thirst again. That living water, the, the spirit of God is in us and it will cause us never to thirst for and, and long for. We can have this life in Christ that he has promised to us, that we can live a life that is strong and we can live a life. And then it says that because of what he has done, it allows us to see what sin is. Sin is the nature of it. And what it is is that that goes against the things of God. And so as we're looking at the scriptures tonight, we want to look at the fact that we have Acts is talking about what the Holy Spirit living in us. It's about what the Holy Spirit having his way in our lives to, to lead us, guide us, and direct us in what? All of the truth that we might know who we are in Christ Jesus, our Lord. In Acts chapter 6, it talked about seven men that were, were going to be used for the serving of bread. It talked about that the, the, the disciples were busy teaching the word of God. They were, they were in building up the body of Christ. The church had been getting to grow. And because of that, they had grown in such a way that it took so much time for them to be able as that number came uh, to them that day. 3,000 coming to know the Lord. 3,000 coming to know the Lord. And now they're teaching them, building them up that they might walk in the strength of the Lord. They said, we're going to be busy. In fact, it, to baptize that many people, because what, when you came to salvation in Christ, they immediately baptized you. So they got busy, and they took them hours to be able to baptize a number that big. But the Word of God tells us that these seven were chosen to pass out bread to the widows. They were the Hellenistic, uh, widowers, widowers, and the, and the Hebrew uh, women who were widows. And it said that there was the dis distribution and we felt like it wasn't fair. So they said, we want to minister because why? That's what the church does. We minister to those that are in the body of Christ as well as minister to those who are not. For we're showing our love, as James said, I'll show you my faith by my works. 
And so we begin to live it out. It said the 12 summoned the full numbers of the, the, uh, the apostles. The, and it said to them, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. So it says that we're going to do something great. So therefore pick out among you seven men of good report, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word of God. It tells us the empowerment because why? Without the word of God in our lives, how can we stand? If we don't know the truth that sets us free, then we will continue to be bound up in my thoughts and my ideas. The other part of it is, is that you don't do anything without prayer. There is nothing that we can do if we don't put prayer as our what? As the tracks that the train rides up on. We cannot go without the empowerment of prayer and so it's important that we be daily in in that closet that we talk about that prayer closet praying to God trusting him sometimes we say that I, when I'm praying I really don't feel anything well you know sometimes I, I'm just going to tell you it's not based on what you feel it's about who you know and sometimes that you know that you have the Holy Spirit in you and when you pray you are praying to him who has given you life, and he will hear you. And then the qu question is, will I have the faith after I pray to trust God to do that? The farmer has faith. He puts the seed into the ground, and he doesn't go out every day to see if it's starting to sprout. He trusts that once I put it in the ground, the rain will come, the sun will come down upon it, and it will begin to grow. We have to trust God that as we study to show ourselves a proof of workmen that needs not to be ashamed, that we will, he will build us up in a, what? a most holy faith that we may be able to walk with him day in and day out. So they said we are looking for seven, and they're looking for a certain type, one who, whose lifestyle is of a, a good reputation, a, a good repute. And that it says that the one that they're full of the spirit of God, and then they have the wisdom of God operating in them and out of them. And it said then we would point them to this duty of passing out bread. And that they and the thought of that pleased the people. And then it said they chose Stephen, and it said, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, one who is what? Also full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Again, you can't just go out without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. You would think in yourself, why would it take the Holy Spirit to pass out bread? Well, have you ever dealt with somebody that's hungry, without clothes, no food, no money? Sometimes they, they feel so bad, they're so angry at everything they may come at you as if you were the enemy when you're trying to reach them. I remember a friend of mine who used to go trapping, and sometimes he would find, well, one time he found his own dog caught in the trap. And when he got, tried to release the dog, the dog kept, what, snapping at him. The dog was in so much pain that he kept nipping at him, even when they were, he knew that his owner loved him, and he was trying to calm him down. But when you're in pain and agony, you, you snap, you, you bite. And, and that's what it said that those women were enraged. They felt left out. They, they felt like no one cared about them. And, and when you're in that state, you need someone with empowerment of the, the love of God. You need somebody who's trusting God. And you need someone that has the wisdom, and as scripture says, who is slow to speak and quick to listen, and then slow to become agitated or angry because someone's snapping at you. Have you ever tried to do something for someone and they snapped at you and you go, why, why worry about it? Why, why should I even care if they're going to act like that? But here it said that they wanted them to have wisdom because they understood their purpose and God's plan that none would lack anything, that all the needs would be met. So it picked that, and they were looking for those that were what? Filled with the Spirit of God, with godly wisdom, huh? a good reputation, and the wisdom of God. 
filled with the Spirit of God. And so it takes that for what? Everyday living. And that's what we were seeing when we're looking at the, the study of Acts. We're talking about the, the character that God had called us to. When we talked about earlier that for about correction and, and guidance and stuff, that the empowerment of God that, that Jesus was saying to give them that they could bind and lose. We talked about Ananias and Sapphira and how, how the Holy Spirit dealt with them when they lied about the money that they were laying down. And it said immediately he died and then she came in hours later and told the same lie and she died. And they had a power and authority to deal with that circumstance and situation. And we want to find that more as we go through scripture that, that God is saying that he, he is able to minister and check us through the body of Christ. Now that ain't about us just trying to read everybody's mail. That's not trying to lord over anybody, but it's about building up, it's about encouraging, allowing people to understand God's love that they might grow in the right relationship that is in him. It said the apostles, after they chose these seven men, that the apostles uh, prayed again, they prayed, over them, laying hands on them to send them out to do the word. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of, of the leaders, the priests, became obedient to the faith. What they were saying was that as the word went out, the truth and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit allowed those that were coming to faith to grow in the understanding of the purpose of God in their life through Jesus Christ. There's something about it, that understanding God's purpose for your life and for mine. And our life, and our life in Christ is not about us understanding who we are, but understanding who he is in us. That, we, that, that allows us to begin to what? Begin to have purpose for what we're doing. And it may seem small in some areas, but here it had what? The empowerment of those that were what? Passing out bread. Because why? They were also going to minister to every soul that they were handing the bread to. It said that one of the men that they picked, his name was Stephen. And Stephen was bold and he had been out preaching the, the word of God. And, and, and they said and the Holy Spirit was using him. And he began to lay out God's promise. He gave them scriptures out of the Old Testament that, that we call us today. And, and he gave it how that God had made those promises and how that Jesus had fulfilled the promises of God that had been given by the prophets. How the word of God had came out and described that one that would come, that one that would die on the cross, that one that would hang between two transgressors, that he would hang on the tree. All of those things, the scriptures talked about that. They said his name shall be Jesus. That it said that he, what? that he might save his people, that there was a purpose and a plan for Jesus to come. And so when we look at the scripture, it says that Peter began, excuse me, that Stephen had began to share with them. And the more that they heard about God's word and God's promise and how Jesus was lining up and all the things that he did in his walk here on earth. See, he was letting the light of who he was being seen by the things he did. It's important that we let the light of who we are be seen by the things that we do. And so as, it, as he was sharing it, the more they heard, the more they began to be upset. Because when he finally says to them, and we look at scripture, that Stephen, full of grace and power, and doing great wonders and signs, of, signs among the people, that some of those who belonged to the synagogue, but they could not understand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. And they, and they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribe, and they came upon him, and they seized him and brought him before the council. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like that of the face of an angel. What they said was that we're, we're mad at what he's saying. We don't like what he's saying. They said that he, he is a horrible person. They wanted him dead. They wanted him done. They wanted him to be shut up. And yet all they could see was what the glory of God upon him. There's something about it. When people are coming at us, do they see the glory of God or do they just see us? 
Are we quick to have that fuse just go off and, and quickly? Or, or are we willing to allow the Holy Spirit to give us a peace to what that transcends all of our understanding? In chapter 7, it said that, in verse 54, Now when they heard these things that Stephen was sharing with them, it said they were enraged and they <laughs> ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. It says that when the opposition of life comes, we need to what? Put our focus on him who is able, on the things above and not on the things of the earth. It said when things got rough and got tough, all he saw was what? God's present in front of him. He wasn't looking at those that were coming at him. He didn't look at them that were coming against him. He understood that what? The gates of hell may come against you. But I'm going to stand on the rock that is in Jesus. And so he began to focus on that. That was life to him. And it said that they were upset. They were enraged. And they were grinding their teeth at him. They were they were mad because they had heard the truth and they didn't like it. See, there's times that we're going to be dealing with things and, and have to deal with things not only outside of the church, but inside the church. And some of the things that you may share with people may not be received. I was thinking when I was getting ready to say that, that I used to hear that the truth will set you free. Well, I used to hear people say that years ago when I was young. And what it meant was that they just want to say things that would hurt you and cut you. But the, actually, it is the truth of Jesus sets us free. And it says that when you hear the truth and you receive the truth, it allows a freedom. But if you don't receive it, that truth begins to jab at you. It begins to cut deep within you. It begins to upset you. It makes people feel like, make you feel like people are pointing their finger and saying you're not good enough or you're not this, but that's not the truth. It's just allowing you to know that we what? all come short of the glory of God and we all need a Savior. And so I pray that you never had someone that, that has shared with you, letting you know that you're the worst person in the whole wide world. Because if they're coming at you, then they have to be second. I'm just saying what, they, what they're saying to you, that there may need to be changes in your life. But they're not telling you something you don't know. That's why it's so important that I tell you about the truth that is able to set you free. And his name is Jesus. It's about God's love and why he came. Because the truth of it is, every one of us need a Savior. It says that he began to preach with them, and they began to get so mad and so angry at him. But all they could see was what the glory of God upon him. Because his face was shining like that of an angel. Now when they heard these things that enraged them, it ticked them off. And it says, to the point. That it said that, but him full of the Spirit, he saw what? The glory of God and Jesus. He saw the glory of God, God the Father, the glory of God, God the Father. Then he saw Jesus, the Son of God, the Word that became flesh. And he saw that because why? He had God the Holy Spirit in him. So you see God in all three persons operating during that moment. And behold, it says... He said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. What he just said to them was the Jesus that you crucified, I see him now received into the presence of God. And he is what? On the right hand. So he's in authority. He's in that place that only who could be? The Messiah himself. And they cried out with a loud voice, and they stopped up their ears, and they rushed together at him. And then they cast him out of the city, and they stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were, were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He understood they were there to kill him. And he said, Lord, receive my spirit, because I know that this is my end. As I said earlier, when you have Jesus, you have all that you need. And he said, a him full of the spirit, with him falling on his knees, he cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. He said, Lord, don't, don't hold it against them. 
Because while they're operating out of their flesh, they're operating out of their lack of understanding your plan, your purpose for their lives. They're just doing what, what men do. When you don't know Jesus, that's how we live. We operate out of our own understanding. Out of our own understanding. It said after he said that and he asked God to do what Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He said, Lord, don't hold this sin against them. And then in chapter 8, it talks about Saul, this young man that it said that they laid their clothes down by one, their garments, at the feet of a young man named Saul. And then it says in verse chapter 8, Saul ravaged the church and Saul approved of his execution. And there rose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles, devout men, uh, buried Stephen, and made a great lament, lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house, and he drug off men and women and committed them to prison. And who was he grabbing? He was grabbing those who were standing on the name of Jesus. Now, he may have given them an opportunity to say to them that we're renouncing Jesus and we're holding on to our Jewish faith, but they had come to live in Christ. The Spirit of God was in them, and they were trusting God no matter what their circumstance and situation was facing. The other part that I wanted us to, to see real quick was that as we read the scripture, it said that, persecution would come. Jesus had told the apostles that persecution was going to come because they put their faith and trust. The word of God also told them that what, that if they hate me, you know that they what, they're going to hate you as well. So we need to know that being a child of God does not cause people to love you because Jesus loves you. God loves you. You find that when you stand on the things of Christ, people may accuse you of what? Thinking that you are holier than thou, that you are more important and you think you something. But when you truly know Christ, that you understand that you are saved by grace because why? You look in the mirror every day and you see that person and you're saying to them and saying to yourself, I know it's only by the love of Christ because why? I would not even use me the way God has chosen to use me. I would find something better and yet God chooses to do that. He shows us love. The other thing I wanted to see that it said, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Now, when they scattered, they went into what? They went into Judea and Samaria. When Jesus ascended, we saw that in the beginning of Acts, it said that he told them that they would go and they would preach and go and go to this area and that area. Before Jesus, they had never entered into Samaria because, remember, they were upset. They were, didn't understand that Jesus was talking to that woman at the well. And then the woman at the well said to Jesus, you being a Jew, you're talking to me, a Samaritan, and a woman? And Jesus understood that his purpose was that the none should perish, that all should come to everlasting life. But it was until the Holy Spirit came into them that they understand that God meant that what all people come to the saving knowledge of him. That all would come. Not just the Jewish people, but he said that he came that all should come to him. And so here they were now being scattered, scattered into Samaria, Judea. And then what the scripture says into the, the outer, the outer parts, that that you're not comfortable to with, those places that you may not ever thought of yourself going to, you find yourself now being drawn to those times such as that. They talked about there, Saul, this individual, had now taken a, a charge against all those who had put their faith in Jesus, but it caused them to what? Go out and share this hope with other people. Maybe right now, the things that you're going through, giving you an opportunity to share your faith with others. Everybody, it seems like, and their mama is on Facebook. They're talking, they're chatting, they're doing these things there, and it gives us a great opportunity to chat with others about the goodness of God. 
to let them know what God is doing. When they're asking you that question, how you doing? God's keeping me. I'm praying. I'm doing the things I need to do, but I also know that I need God's protection, and I'm trusting him to give me what I need as we go through this time and these days that we're fine going through. The word goes on to say, the devout men buried Stephen, and they laid it over him, but Saul did what? He caused a rage to come. He continued to go against them. And then it says, talked about the other one, Philip. And it talks about how Philip was being led by the Holy Spirit. And then it said, an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go towards the south to a road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he said he rose and he went. And he found an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship. What it tells us is that the Jewish people had shared, had shared, and people had come to faith in Judaism. And so during that high time in that place, in that, that time when, when Jesus was there and they were having the holy time and, and they were getting ready, he was there. He was there. The church is alive, and, and he had come to worship there at the synagogue. And going back, it says that, that the word had gotten out and that he had a measure of faith. And that it says, and this person was one of high authority, but he was a eunuch. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning and was sitting in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. And so Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? He says, I'm reading it, but I'm only getting information. And I'm not understanding how that's going to apply to my life. My question to you today, are you reading the word or information, or you're looking for how does it apply to my life. I remember a time that I had surface understanding of the Word of God. It wasn't deep at all. It was surface. And I used what I thought, my intellect, on what God's Word had to say. I believe that Christ came, died for me, but my understanding of what the Holy Spirit in me was to do was never made clear. And I remember struggling because why? Like this man here, I was reading, I understood the stories, and I understood that Jesus died. I had John 3, 16 down. I just didn't have 17. I didn't understand of his great love. I didn't understand why he had to do everything. I understood that he did for me that I might come to be saved, but I didn't understand what saved living was truly all about. This man said, I'm reading it, but how can I re understand it unless somebody begins to share it with me, open my understanding? Philip opened his mouth, beginning with the script, these scriptures. He told him the good news about Jesus. Here it tells us what everything about Jesus is always about good news. Good news is that what? I don't have to live in sin anymore. I don't have to be separated from God. I do not have to be continue to try to figure out how to be a better person. I come to the understanding that there's no good thing in me. And, and when you get that down into your heart, you begin to understand that if anything good comes out of you, it has to come through Jesus, through the Holy Spirit that is in you. This man said that how can I understand unless somebody lest somebody guides me through this truth. And so he invited Philip to sit with him, and Philip began to tell him about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, see, here's water. What prevents me from being baptized? See, there's something that he said that Jesus has shared with, with the apostles, that they're going into the world and share Christ and then baptized them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
And when we begin to read Acts, it said that everyone that came to the Lord, they immediately took them out and baptized them. When he came to that saving knowledge through the Holy Spirit, see, the Holy Spirit had been working on him. He had the word of God with him. He was trying to understand it. He just needed what more clarity on what God's word was saying to him. And that's what happened to me. That's what has happened to you and many others, that clarity through the Holy Spirit began to reveal to you who you are in Christ Jesus. And when we begin to see who we are in Christ Jesus, it is sure so much better than who we were when we were all in ourselves. It said that he began to see this and began to understand it. And then he understood that Jesus Christ died for him, was buried, rose again, ascended up into heaven. And he said that for that reason, Jesus had come. And then he said, must have said, I want Jesus in my life. I know that I'm a sinner. I know I need Christ. And then he said, here's some water. What prevents me to be baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water. Now, where did Philip meet him? It said he met him in what? A desert place. That means there's no water. And yet God had provided water for him to be baptized in. The other thing I want us to see is that he's a eunuch. A eunuch could never become a Jewish person. He couldn't have been a proselyte. He couldn't come to know uh, the belief of Judaism because he was a eunuch. But when it comes to Jesus, we read earlier what? All whoever come, let them come, let them drink. The eunuch was there to drink of the living water that was in Jesus Christ. Philip and the eunuch, uh, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And then it says, and they came up out of the water and the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away and the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. There's something about when Christ comes into your life, you know you're not the same. The old has passed away and the new has come in. What it means is that that part of you, that sin nature that was bringing forth death is now gone and new life has come in you through the spirit of the Holy Spirit in your life. And then we moved on to chapter 9. The word tells us that Saul was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. And he went to the high priest and he asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, being believers in the way of Jesus, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why persecute me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now, in himself, he has to think, I have not persecuted Jesus, but Jesus is saying, when you persecute one of mine, you are persecuting me. Because why? He is the Christ. And we are his. We are in him. Now, how do we know? Because we have the Holy Spirit in us who reveals Jesus to us. You have Jesus in you. You have him in you. You have the Spirit of God in you. And it says that he was persecuting them on the way. He said, who are you? He said, I am Jesus. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you? I'm Jesus. And then Jesus said to him, rise and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. Let me read this to you again. He's on his way to Damascus. He's got papers, authority to arrest anyone. And on his way, the shepherd intervened. He couldn't get to them because he had to go through Jesus. He couldn't get to them 
See, somewhere along the line, the enemy thinks he's getting away with things. But then Jesus, the shepherd, intervenes. And, and he intervened uh, on him. And it says, and then Saul fell to the ground because the light had, had come upon him. And he says, who are you? And he, Jesus says, I am Jesus whom you persecute. He tells him then to rise and enter the city. And then he says, I'm going to tell you what you are going to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. That had to freak them out because what? They're hearing something and can't figure out where is it coming from. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither he ate nor he drank. There's some things that happen in our lives when God touches us. There may be troubles, there may be circumstances, there may be situations that have come your way when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and he begins to deal with you. And it's in those times that you may have said before, I don't want nothing to do with you, Jesus. But I find that people, life circumstances, make you begin to rethink things. And all of a sudden you find people that are going through some of the things you went through and they don't have the same look on their face. They don't have the same anger. They don't have the same frustration. And you're knowing that they're going through the same thing you're going through and you're asking them, how are you doing it? And the answer is Jesus. Saul has seen these people binding them up and said that he was still doing murdering. It says that he was there for the murder of Stephen. And so here he was doing that. And all he saw was what? I have to believe that he was still seeing the glory of God upon every man and woman that he was dragging off. They were praising him. They were singing hymns unto the Lord. They were praising him, praying to him, giving him praise, giving him glory for transforming their lives. And that if I might must die because I believe and trust in you, I'm praising you because you died for me that I might live. I know he had to think they were crazy because the Holy Spirit was moving up on them in such a way. The scriptures go on to tell us that there was a, a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, rise and go to a street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and laying his hand on him so that he might regain his sight. Now the Lord's speaking to him and he's talking to him because why he trusts. And isn't it something that he said when he, when he heard the voice, he immediately said, here I am, Lord. Isn't there something about if you have a relationship with God that you know that voice? You know when the word of God is speaking to you. You know when the Holy Spirit is moving in you. There's something about when your understanding begins to open up and you begin to know the heart and, and through, uh, of God through the word of God and then through walking out in faithfulness to him that you begin to divide, that you build a relationship with him. It takes me back to that in Genesis when it said that Adam and Eve and, and they and Adam heard the Lord walking in the cool of the day. Now God's a spirit and he can feel the presence of God coming towards him. Wouldn't it be something when we begin to walk in such a way in obedience to the things of God, in the empowerment of the spirit of God, with the word of God becoming alive in us, that we would begin to know the voice of God when he speaks to us. He speaks to Ananias. And the Lord said to him and to him to rise and Go to a street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for Saul because he's looking for you because he's seen me in a vision. Now we know that his sight has been taken away from him, but yet God's revealing it to him about a man named Ananias that's coming to lay his hands on him so that he might regain sight. 
Ananias answered and said, Lord, I have heard of, from many about this man and how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Now he had caused others to suffer. Now the Lord is saying he's going to suffer many things for my name's sake. Now what God is not saying is that I'm going to get even with him for messing with my children. No, he said, I'm going to reveal myself in, in such a way to him that he will begin to love me, that he will even put himself in jeopardy for my name's sake, that he will begin to understand why Stephen was Stephen. He will understand why the other men and women that he had been binding up, that they, would, they found themselves in faith with God. He said he will suffer many things. He said it's going to be out of a love relationship that he's going to say yes and amen to me because he will recognize my great love for him and what I did on Calvary for him when I took his sins upon me while beaten and bruised for him. And he says, and he said to him, he will suffer many things, but I'm going to use him before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. See, what it's saying is that God can use anyone for his purpose. And he is not looking at you to be the best. He is looking at you to be what? Obedient to his word that is life to all of us. So Ananias departed and he entered in the house and he laid hands on him and he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who, you, who appeared to you on the road, by which you came has sent me so I that I may lay, regain, that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. And then he rose and was baptized again immediately. When you come into the saving knowledge of God through Jesus Christ our Lord, immediately they baptize him. Baptism doesn't save, but it's the first part of obedience that God has called us to, that we experience what? His death, burial, and resurrection of coming up out of the water. And it says, and then he took food and he was strengthened. The power of God moved in such a way that immediately when he met him, it lets us know that the Holy Spirit was working. As he saw the witness in the lives of others who had professed Christ, and they were standing on the name of Jesus no matter what came their way. They did not back up because opposition was coming. The gates of hell, opposition was trying to push them back. But the church kept going forward just as Jesus said. Because he is the Christ. He is the foundation. He is the rock on which we stand upon. And it says, and they, that Paul, saw, saw that. That there was something about them. There was something about Stephen. All of them together was a witness after witness after witness about the things. And then here comes this man, Ananias, that seals the deal. Because while the Holy Spirit has now revealed to him, Ananias was coming and he gave him Ananias' name and what he was going to do. And Ananias in obedience to the things of God. I can't wait to one day to meet Ananias. We only hear this one thing about him. And yet at that time... He impacted the life of one named Saul, whose name is Paul, in a different translation, who the Holy Spirit used to write the second half of Acts, used him, not, not to write it, but it, it rebuilt his life in the second half of Acts. And then in the letters that we read later on in the New Testament, that God can use anyone for his glory. And it says, and after he had rested, after he had taken food, it says, for some days he was with the disciples at Damascus. And the nice went back and told the other brothers, this is what God had done 
And this is what he told me to do, and this is what he has done. And it says, and after he, they embraced him, and he had been with them, it said immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying he, that Jesus is the Son of God. Here this man was persecuting the church, and now he is a spokesman for the kingdom of God, of Jesus Christ. And he says, and all who heard him were amazed and said, is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name. And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus. When we think of what God was doing in chapter 9 of, of Acts, the passage is about Paul and his conversion to Christianity. And at the beginning, we read that what? That he was breathing threats of murder against the disciples of the Lord. But after his encounter with the risen Savior, Jesus the Christ, he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue saying he is the Son of God. And this is the beginning of one of the most significant periods of the growth of the church. Paul will go on to faithfully proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout much of the known world. And Paul's life displayed the power of Jesus to transform. See, that's the other part that we need to see. The transformation of the power of God that comes through Jesus Christ our Lord. That what? That it takes the transforming power of God, the Holy Spirit, for us to know Jesus. And we saw that demonstrated, and we're going to read about that demonstration of what God is able to do in the life of one named Paul, who would go on to faithfully proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul's life displayed the power of Jesus to transform, and this is what is so remarkable about God's word. He magnifies his own name, brings glory to himself by taking broken sinners like Saul, like me, like you, saving them and changing them. And may we also remember how good God has been to us. As we go to prayer, I want you to remember just how good God has been to you. Let us pray. Father, we thank you tonight, Lord, for your goodness, your love that has no end. We thank you, Lord, as we looked at your word, Lord, how you revealed and how you showed us, Lord, that you came that all might come to know you, the saving faith that you would bring, that you would use those of us, Lord, who have been scoundrels in our lives, Lord, that we come into the saving love through your salvation, the forgiveness of sin, and the giving of new life. And that, Lord, that you used Saul, for your glory, to touch lives, and boldly, Lord, with your life in him, he began to preach Jesus Christ, the Lord, the Son of God. Lord, I thank you tonight, Lord, that your love transforms our lives forever and ever. Lord, we thank you tonight, Lord. We pray tonight, Lord, for men and women, boys and girls, Lord, that are dealing with the, the virus, Lord, throughout the world. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, for their safety and for their healing. We pray right now, Lord, for protection, Lord, as many have to go out and in and out, Lord. And, and we find out, Lord, and we're hearing, Lord, that many of those uh, um, firemen and, and, and those that rescue people are themselves becoming infected because of the things they're doing. Those that are in the hospital, Lord, are becoming infected by working with others, Lord. But we pray tonight, Lord, that you will bring forth healing and power. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, that if for saints of God, Lord, that have been infected, may they proclaim the good news of who you are, Lord. As you bring forth healing in their body, may they share, Lord, about the healing virtue, uh, Lord, that you have when it comes to saving us from sin transforming our lives, that we might live a life that would bring glory and honor to you, Lord. We pray your anointing upon your church, that we would glorify you in our coming and in our going. We ask, Lord, that you would use us for the furtherance of your kingdom. And so, Lord, we pray tonight, Lord, that you will be lifted up in this time, Lord, like never before. May we use it, Lord, as, as a stepping stone, Lord, 
to walk in the boldness as the church in the beginning, allowing you, Holy Spirit, to lead us, guide us, and direct us with power and might. In your precious name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. May the Lord keep you.